Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Joel Silverfield, president of the Hillsborough County Medical Association. Tonight, we're going to have our eighth webinar about COVID. On January 15th, 2020, two years ago, almost the anniversary of today, a 35-year-old man returned from Wuhan, China, and fell ill with a cough and a fever. Six days later, he was confirmed as the first known case of the coronavirus in the United States. At that time, the CDC said, risk remains low, unclear whether the virus spreads from person to person. President Donald Trump stated, it's one person coming from China, we have it under control, it's going to be just fine. Presidential candidate Joe Biden stated he was going to beat COVID. Well, it's two years later, we have around 860,000 people dead, 69 million or thereabouts infected, and most Americans now know at least three Greek letters, Alpha, Delta, and Omicron. This year, we've had a lot of celebrities who have been involved, many of them going against vaccines, such as Novik Djokovic and Aaron Rodgers and Kyrie Irving and locally, Antonio Brown. We've also lost the wonderful people such as Colin Powell to this virus. Uh, a year or so ago, The Lancet came out with an article and it stated, uh, if anyone tells you something about COVID with certitude, run. In my office every day, Dr. Sennett and I were just talking, I have my patients are giving me advice and other people all the time about COVID. It reminds me of the story about J.P. Morgan in 1929. J.P. Morgan, at that time the world's richest man, was walking down Fifth Avenue, decided to get his shoes shined, sat down, put his shoes up, and as he was getting his shoes shined, the shoe shine boy said, Mr. Morgan, you should buy some of that consolidated electric. It's a great stock. So J.P. Morgan tipped the shoe shine boy, walked down, Fifth Avenue to his broker and said, sell every stock I own. And his broker said, why? And J.P. Morgan said, well, when the shoeshine boy is giving me advice, it's time to get out. So we're getting a lot of advice. There's a lot of things going on out there. Um, I read an article this past weekend talking about Silicon Valley, and it was talking about the two scariest words you can hear in Silicon Valley are studies show. The second two scariest words are experts say. But I'm going to tell you tonight, our experts are great. They've been with us throughout. They've shown a lot of humility. They are truly experts. They are at the top of their profession. And just to introduce them, we have Dr. Margarita Cabrero Cancia. Uh, she's the medical director, infectious disease associates of Tampa Bay, an affiliate professor, Department of Internal Medicine at the USF School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Cancio was very wonderful to our doctors in this county. When vaccines first came out and they were in short supply, her practice stepped in and helped inoculate several of our physicians in the medical society. And we're still very grateful for that, Dr. Cancio. We have Dr. Douglas Holt. Um, he's a health officer of the Florida Department of Health in Hillsborough County and professor of medicine at the USF Division of Infectious Disease and Internal Medicine. Dr. Holt has been laboring under enormous pressure, extremely shorthanded, underfunded, and I think Hillsborough County has done as well or better than any county in Florida during this, and we are very grateful to him for that. We have Dr. Charlie Lockwood. He's Senior Vice President, USF Health. He is Dean of the USF uh, School of Medicine, and under his uh, auspices. This school has risen to great heights. He's done a wonderful job. And for some of you who didn't get a chance to see his article in the Tampa Tribune on December 20th, I believe, uh, he gives an excellent summary about what's going on with COVID and with great clarity and was very succinct. So if you get a chance, that's an excellent article to read. And finally, we have, and certainly not least, Dr. John Sennett, He's a scientist, I love that designation, and the chairman of internal medicine at the University of South Florida College of Medicine. He's director of the Florida Infectious Disease Institute. And he and I have shared some patients over the past couple of weeks with COVID. And luckily they have survived both of our care. 
So we're going to start with some questions. We've had questions sent in and we've written a few along the way. I'm going to just get started with Dr. Holt. Uh, Dr. Holt, uh, cases peaked nationally in early January, uh, but now they're down about 8%. Um, how is Hillsborough County doing? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schoenfeld. Um, we, uh, for the past week, uh, averaged 2,000 new cases a day. Uh, that's a 38% decrease from the week before. Wow. Just as sort of a point of reference, uh, after Thanksgiving in early December, we were averaging uh, a little less than 100 cases a day. Um, the positivity rate uh, back then was 3%. Uh, percent. Uh, we're at 25. Uh, the good news is, again, the... Uh, impact on each of the cases uh, on our hospital systems uh, has been less on a proportional basis, but clearly when you have this many cases, it has been a big challenge, uh, but our healthcare has risen to that challenge. So you feel like we're doing about as well as most counties are um, with our numbers? How is our vaccine rate in Hillsborough? Well, you know, I, I, I'm a little disappointed in our vaccine rate and, and uh, we've got 64% um, of all of our uh, res total population, which includes some those that are under five that are not eligible, that have had one dose, 54% uh, that have had two, about 18% have been boosted. And as we know, the uh, duration of the primary vaccine, uh, you know, wanes. And in fact, when you look closely at those that have had cases that have been vaccinated, the average uh, day the, between their vaccine and their case is, uh, is almost nine months. So uh, clearly the boosters uh, are absolutely, uh, if you're going to define fully immunized from a vaccine, you need the booster. Thank you. I would also like to, here is something that uh, we received. This is, uh, this talks about co the COVID exposure algorithm. Would you take a minute and just talk about people, if you get exposed to COVID, you know, what one should do? And, you know, the CDC recently came out with this, I think just a five day uh, quarantining and then some people are saying if you're vaccinated and, and boosted that you don't really need to quarantine at all if you don't have symptoms what, what is your what are your feelings on that yeah um, if you've been exposed to omicron you you probably you should presume you're infected um, if you're vaccinated uh, and you're well um, you can uh, in return to work if you will with a mask uh, uh, after five days, and then you should continue the mask for another five days. Um, if you are not vaccinated, then you are again uh, treated as if you were positive. So you are uh, to stay away from people, work for five days, and then wear a mask for six days to 10. So the vaccinated people can be, as long as they're well, can be presumed uh, with precautions to be not infectious, whereas an unvaccinated is inf assumed infected and infectious. That's, that's, that's very good. Dr. Cancio, um, so there's a lot going on with testing these days. Um, I would like for you to break down the various tests, rapid antigen, the PCR. Is there a reason to do antibody testing? You know, the best way to swab, you know, it's interesting. We started out, you know, with the nasal swab, and then recently there's been some controversy about oral swabbing. And I just read where in China they're uh, wanting to do anal swabbing, thinking that's the most accurate. I think that will cut down on the number of Olympic athletes going to China, no doubt. But if you would talk about testing, I'll, we'd love to hear it. You're muted, by the way. You may want to be muted, but we prefer you're not. There we go. Ooh. Thank you for telling me. So, um, so the um, the PCR is obviously the purpose of the PCR is a diagnostic test. Um, so it is the most effective way of knowing whether you're positive or negative. So it's very sensitive, um, 
and, um, and it is very good to diagnose. But what is not good for is that it stays positive for a long time because PCR checks for the genetic material and doesn't tell you whether the, live, the virus is alive or dead. So it is, it is a very good test for diagnostic purposes. Uh, the antigen test um, is, has, is, has, is a very good test. Um, and when you're sick, has a good uh, predictive value, but it does have some false uh, negative. But if you're sick, it has a very good predictive value. It is also better, it correlates better with infectivity, meaning that, that, that if your antigen is positive, it's likely that you are infectious. Once you're no longer, you're negative, you're less likely to be infectious. That's why we have seen some of the hospitals and some of the other healthcare setting using PCR to diagnose, but the antigen to bring uh, individuals, and especially healthcare workers, back to work on day six if they're negative. So that is the difference between the PCR and the antigen. PCR is really good for diagnosis, very sensitive, but remains positive for a long time, weeks and weeks. So, so um, it's kind of, um, you have to interpret in the correct uh, setting. The antigen is only positive when you're infectious and it's being used to bring back uh, the individuals. Ob obviously, most of our home testing are antigen testing. And, uh, and that is uh, a good way when the person is sick to test themselves. And at that point, since you're having symptoms, it's a very good predictive value. Again, you can still have a, 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 false, um, a false negative. And that is why if you look at those little packages, they always have two tests, one for day one, day four, day two. So if both of them are negative, that's a better predictive value that things are okay. But again, they're being used to get patients back uh, um, getting healthcare workers back to the hospital earlier when they're no longer symptomatic. When it comes to the antibodies, there are two kinds of antibodies. Uh, there is the spike protein antibodies and the nuclear capsid. The spike protein antibodies uh, are the ones that you have with the vaccine. Uh, remember that the vaccine works because those spike proteins are how the virus attaches uh, so the antibodies against the spike protein is what the vaccine provides. And those are the antibodies that after five months of the two series vaccine, you see the numbers coming down. And that's why you need that booster to get those spike protein antibodies back up to a better level. Um, and, uh, and, those, and those are available quantitatively. Um, nobody really knows exactly what the number is that a good number is, and there's a lot of debate, but, it, but you want a higher number, probably um, somewhere in, um, greater than 250 would be a good number, even though nobody knows what a good number is. Some studies have shown 50, as low as 50 being okay. But we can see most of the patients that have been boosted have pretty good numbers above 250. We um, just had a know. question come in, or any of the over-the-counter antigen tests superior to the others? I know we've just ordered 500 million tests from the federal government. I think if you go to uh, covidtest.gov, the government will send you tests. It takes about seven to 12 days to ship it. Those tests are all coming from China. Are there any uh, tests that you feel are better quality than others? Uh, I, I don't know. I think that in general, I, I don't, I, I think that any test, I mean, they're gonna be a minor viability I don't know if any of the other panels feel that way, but I think that just if you have two tests and you're having symptoms, they probably have a pretty a good uh, positive predictive value. So right. I think that that's probably as good. And 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 it is comfortable to have. It's a good thing to have uh, home testing. And in the setting of having symptoms and knowing what the symptoms are for Omicron, I think that the the probably any test or the antigen test, uh, any one of them will be okay. Very good, thank and you. And then going back to the um, to the to the finishing up the question about the antibodies that you asked me. So the, the spike protein antibodies is the one with the vaccine. There's a regular antibody with a nuclear capsid that that tells you whether you have had the virus or not. Um, and that um, that usually uh, is positive about seven to ten days after you have had the disease. And some patients continue to have it. Some patients lose it at some point, like around three months. 
uh, many patients lose that, um, that positive um, uh, IgG, as in it is an IgG test. So that's the answer about the um, testing and the antibodies. Thank you very much. Dr. Sennett, um, Janet Woodcock from the FDA says, most people are going to get COVID. Anthony Fauci from NIH said, COVID will infect just about everybody. Dr. Tedros from the WHO said, we have to be realistic. We are not going to stop Omicron. And then locally, uh, and I don't know him, Dr. Jason Salemi from USF said, a lot of people are still going to die because of how transmissible Omicron has been. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Should we just give up and start giving COVID uh, parties like we used to give chickenpox parties? Well, to um, start off with that, I think um, if you're going to have a COVID party, I would have it for people you don't like. <laughs> the um, The... Uh, naturally acquired immunity is not nearly as strong as vaccine immunity. Uh, the way antigen is processed when it first encounters a foreign organism is that the first antibody that binds triggers that clone of antibodies. So it may not be the best one. Whereas with a vaccine, you're getting pure spike protein. So they're definitely better. Um, when I look at people that have second episodes of Omicron, and I have a bunch, okay? Um, almost all of them did not get a booster after their Omicron shot. They thought they didn't need it, but they did. Does that answer your question? So I think you're right, and I, and I, and I would guess if you're unvaccinated, uh, you're saying if you're unvaccinated that your risk is pretty high. In fact, you know, the, the point being that Omicron is less severe, if you look at the unvaccinated, it's still a pretty serious illness uh, compared to Delta. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I don't know where this idea of a mild syndrome came from. Uh, I have 188 patients in Tampa General right now, none of whom think that Omicron is a mild illness. Um, in general, the mortality is probably half that of Delta, but the human suffering is terrible. The long-term side effects are unknown. Recall it took 20 years for us to recognize when we connected the dots, that there was a post-COVID syndrome. And there was clearly a post-COVID syndrome now. Um, I think that vaccination is our best hope of staying disease-free. And you wanna augment that with a mask, social distancing, and avoiding crowds. Uh, what, what happens if you don't? Well, and what I think a uh, terrible statistic is that 1% of Americans over 65 are dead of COVID. How do you even understand that number? It's, a, it's a, a unbelievable, yeah. So that's an interesting, the, so this leads me into something for Dr. Lockwood, if he would deem to become unmuted. It's kind of like the a series about the undead, the unmuted. Um, <laughs> So, Dr. Lockwood, this is sort of a macro question. Uh, how has, you know, COVID changed our lives? I want you to sort of philosophize a bit. You know, people who went through the Depression, even years after the Depression, they were still marked by having gone through a life of scarcity. They would still cut off lights. They would stay in the shower less long. If you would just take a minute or two and talk about how COVID has already impacted us from work, church, Concerts, travel, romance, telehealth, uh, general national mental health. Well, what are you seeing from the macro? Yeah, I'd say that it's been a stress tester for all those things. Um, it's exacerbated uh, racial disparities and class disparities. It's exacerbated um, political polarization. 
Um, it's exacerbated the, the, the trend toward um, medical illiteracy, a, a lack of understanding, which is, 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 has many factors contributing to it. Some of them are literally literacy and inability to speak English. Some of them relate to just the sheer complexity of, of medical information and the sheer, sheer pace of increase in, in medical information. But, but this has exacerbated it. I think it has shown the, the negative power of social media in confusing people and in spreading disinformation. Uh, you know, if you listen to some of these insane anti-vax protesters in Washington, including sadly Robert Kennedy's son, really tragic actually, um, it, it, their message is, is, is been allowed to proliferate because of the confluence of social media with, with, uh, with COVID. Um, and, and it's definitely a bipartisan um, a condemnation uh, since I think there has been an overreach on the left in terms of the, benefic the benefits of uh, closing schools, of lockdowns, of the, an, an, honestly an overestimate of the value of, of simple masks other than N95s or even surgical masks, multiply masks. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, those things, I guess, were going to happen anyways, they've just been accelerated. It is clear that particularly in Northern schools where there was a significant um, uh, disruption in student education, there is a profound effect on student learning and, and child development. And we're just beginning to get a handle on that. And Florida deserves some credit, uh, certainly deserves some blame too, but you know, if you look at the impact of Florida on the school systems, substantially less than certainly New England, New York, New Jersey, California, et cetera. Um, we also obviously came out of the, the, the episode, not that we're out of it yet, in much better financial shape than a lot of the Northern states. Um, and yet we did reasonably okay with, with mortality. We're about the middle of the country in mortality although we had the most vulnerable population. So, you know, we take a lot of beatings, Florida does in the national media, uh, especially MSNBC and, CM and, C and uh, CNN, it's all virtually a continuous negative diatribe uh, against Florida. But the actual facts um, suggest we did pretty well. And we, we certainly um, weren't way off the curve in terms of uptake of vaccine, mortality rates and so forth. Um, and yet we did better clearly from a school child development and, and business standpoint, um, which suggests that there, there was some overselling of some of the uh, mitigation uh, strategies that, that were used. I was in Tallahassee on, uh, on Tuesday and uh, I went into pretty much equal numbers of Democrat and Republican legislatures, although they're, they're vanishingly few uh, Democrats left in the House. Um, and when you went into the Democrats' offices, of course, everybody was wearing masks. They were all carefully socially isolated. All the politicians were wearing masks. Um, and in the Republican legislators, no one's wearing masks. There was no social isolation. And yet the rates of Omicron infection are exactly the same among Democratic and Republican legislators. So um, again, you know, I, I, am, I want to be sure that I, my my vilification is bipartisan because the, the corruption of science has been, has fell on both sides. And it's, it's, it is maybe one of the lasting and most painful leg legacies of COVID um, because we've lost the moral high ground that physicians and scientists uh, had been able to, to maintain for a very long time. And, and that's a great tragedy for sure. There are probably a lot of great things that have resulted from, from Omicron. Um, and from COVID in general. I think telehealth is here to stay. It's uh, hugely popular uh, as long as we can maintain funding for it, um, particularly in areas like psychiatry where that has become the primary mode of interfacing with your patient. Um, I think that, that will do good. Remote monitoring of patients is gonna uh, allow us to reduce length of stay and, and reduce readmissions and have some beneficial effects on the healthcare economy there for sure. Uh, there probably will be a um, a ready, more ready acceptance, certainly among Democrats, um, or as George um, Packard would say, 
um, just Americans and smart Americans versus free Americans uh, and real Americans um, of using masks, which may reduce other respiratory viruses, which is a, a good thing. And obviously we've developed a whole new strategy for vaccination with, with the use of messenger RNA, which has applicability for many other conditions and can be used kind of just in time for the next wave of, of uh, pandemics that will almost certainly happen given climate change and globalization. So lots of changes. I mean, I could go on on the educational implications of this forever, um, but clearly, um, you know, we will be living with the sequelae of, of uh, COVID-19 for a very long time. And, you know, I, I remember my dad not only talking about the Great Depression, but um, the impact of the influenza pandemic on his parents. Um, and that was, you know, 75 years later. So, you know, th these things I think will have a, a long, uh, a, a long memory, long shadow. Um, and uh, as I say, we've probably gone all, all night about this. Very good. Well, I, 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 thank you very much. That was very helpful. Uh, Dr. Holt, um, would you mind giving us a vaccines update? Um, you know, where we stand with our different vaccines? What about boosters? Um, you know, um, there have been some controversy about natural immunity. I think Dr. Sennett actually touched on this versus uh, the vaccine. Um, how, where do we stand on the vaccines and which ones are you recommending? And are you recommending the booster? And is there, are, are there a group of patients that you would recommend the fourth vaccine in? Yeah, that's a great question and a lot there. Let me, let me start with what's going on. Um, so in the past week, um, 18,000 doses were administered in Hillsborough County. Uh, only 20% or 3,500 were first time new people getting their first dose. 50% um, are boosters. So most of us, the boosters being, or the doses being given in Hillsborough County are uh, for boosters. Um, and uh, at this current rate we're going, uh, we won't get to 60% of our um, population fully boosted into probably early May. Um, the uh, Options, availability, I think, as far as choice of vaccines, uh, I, I think uh, the mRNA, mRNA uh, Pfizer, Moderna uh, are clearly uh, ones that I would recommend and, 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 uh, uh, and have done. Um, a third dose I think we've talked about is absolute. I think the fourth dose for uh, Certainly the high risk or, or those at risk or, uh, is also one that I think is a uh, is, um, uh, best in practice. Uh, for the rest of this, uh, I think uh, it's perhaps not uh, required or something I would um, uh, push for, but I certainly personally, if I was myself and others, uh, I am intending to get uh, that fourth dose. Okay. Uh, I know that um, in certain countries, uh, such as uh, Israel, they want you to stay in the same lane. In the UK, they think switching to a different vaccine for your follow-up dose is a good idea. Do you have a feeling on that one way or the other? Um, you know, I, uh, I, and again, I may defer to some of my colleagues, but uh, I can tell you personally, I, I was a Pfizer uh, because it was the first one available. I had access to it, first one on the booster. Uh, as I look forward, uh, I'm leaning towards uh, crossing, crossing lanes uh, and probably doing a, a Moderna for my, my next one. I think there is some science that does support that. Um, uh, to what degree? I, I, I think it's more important that you get a vaccine versus which one, but when you get into the the nuances, uh, I do believe there is some value to that changing lanes, but I would certainly open that one up. Okay. What about uh, ages as far as uh, how young children should be vaccinated? And uh, if you take a minute and just talk about side effects as well about the vaccine side effects. 
Yeah, we're it's uh, now approved down to the age of five, and I think that will continue. Uh, they're just taking their time to go further down. Uh, we've got about 20% of our five to 11 year olds vaccinated. Um, again, the side effects uh, have remained pretty much the, the local and some of the systemic, uh, you know, uh, aches and pains, same th type of things we've had with pretty much all uh, uh, previous vaccines. I'd say comparable to influenza is the way I think about it. Uh, there have been some, you know, reports and there is a, there is some documentation of more serious side effects, myocarditis and things, but the, the, the rate and the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the rate of that happening is, is really comparable to pretty much any of our vaccines that we have been using, you know, over our practices. You know, it's interesting when they look at uh, placebo versus vaccine side effects, um, the placebo has about almost as many side effects as does the vaccine, which is pretty typical. I mean, I think just giving someone an injection often results in a side effect as opposed to taking a pill. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Cancio, uh, would you, uh, been a couple of articles out about the contagiousness index. Would you compare, will you tell us what the contagiousness index is and how uh, Alpha, Delta, and Omicron, how they compare on the contagiousness index. You have to unmute, as uh, if, if you would unmute. Dr. Cancio, you have there, you thank you. There we go. So uh, Omicron is uh, a lot more, um, obviously much more contagious than, uh, than um, any of the prior variants. Uh, and actually there is a um, new um, kind of like, just like remember like Delta plus, we now have a Omicron BA2 because the regular Omicron is was BA1 and BA2 and that one uh, we have, um, hasn't been as um, common in the US yet, but Denmark and some other European countries that have, have, and it looks somewhat similar, it has more mutations, but it looks somewhat similar. Which, which is, but it looks more contagious. So it seems like Omicron is a lot more contagious than Delta and Delta was a lot more contagious than the original um, 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 uh, variant. Uh, so it seems like we're getting um, more contagious types diseases. Luckily, it looks like Omicron is not, uh, um, is it still serious, but not uh, the side effect that the, um, the illness is not as bad as Delta as Delta was, um, there's little experience about the BA2 or the new Omicron, um, and but it but it doesn't look like it's any different than the um, that the BA1 or the Omicron that we have now. Okay, th thank you, thank you very much. Um, let's see here, uh, Doctor Senate, would you uh, if you would break down the treatment of outpatient COVID? Someone sent a question in, and they said a 60 in fact, I just got, believe it or not, I just got a text of mine from a 70-year-old patient of mine, but a 60-year-old man uh, who's generally healthy, he's been vaccinated, uh, starts having some symptoms of a sore throat, cough, and congestion. He does a home test. It's positive for COVID. Now what? Okay, he has COVID. Um, the very first step is anticoagulation. He should take uh, either an adult or a baby aspirin, the second he gets that test positive. The first four days are the psychotic days of COVID with strokes, heart attacks, patients, literally a patient we had here thrombose both legs, okay? Um, after that, the ideal treatment, the perfect treatment is a regimen, not a pill. And that's what I liked about your treatment. You know, the pill is going to get rid of the virus. So if I gave you penicillin for a strep throat, well, the strep are dead in an hour, but you're going to feel bad for a week. So what I do is first I try to get them pa Paxlovid, okay? And then 
you must take a meticulous medical history. Paxlovid has very dangerous interactions with cardiac medications, seizure medications, and some cancer medications. So it takes a while to go down the list and make sure they're not on that. The pharmacists have, I think at their disposal, it seems to be a, a, a briefer list. Uh, the entire list is online. So uh, about 25% of people over 60 can't take that or you can stop it and deal with the side effects. I did that the other day, a patient on flecainide for AFib, but with a lot of risk factors. He's obese, he's diabetic, he can put up with AFib, he can't put up with COVID. So I just stopped the flecainide. If he goes into AFib, we'll address that later. Um, if you can't get uh, that agent as a treatment, and it is hard to get. The second line drug is molnupinavir, the Merck product, okay? That's four pills twice a day for five days. Uh, it's very effective. I would tell you that it's greater than 90% with Paxlovid and at least 50% with molnupinavir. An alternate drug is an older antidepressant, fluvoxamine, which I actually have had excellent luck with patients. First, they get a good night's sleep. And I find it sort of interesting that some of the patients that you and I have shared, they tell me they don't want to go off the fluvoxamine. <laughs> they feel much better. <laughs> um, so those kill the virus, but you've got to deal with the symptoms. So number one, Tylenol at maximum dose. Number two, a humidifier, okay? We've tried a variety of regimens. It seems to be 20 minutes, four times a day is the best with them sitting in the humidifier or proning, laying on the bed, and having the humidifier blow in their face. Third, while Delta affected smell and taste, of all things, Omicron, as far as I can tell clinically, affects how thirsty you are. All of my patients have been very dehydrated. If I find one that's not tilt positive, it's a miracle. So I'm putting them on two quarts of fluids a day, either half and half water and Gatorade or just water, but they've got to hydrate, okay? We mentioned the aspirin, and then I very carefully add Advair. I do that to prepare them for the second phase of illness, which is pulmonary inflammation. Uh, you cannot exceed 115 micrograms of uh, budesonide or any of these steroids. So I put them on Advair, 115, 21, two puffs a day, absolutely no more. Second, I put them on Flonase, which is not absorbed at all, but it opens up the nasal passages so they don't mouth breathe. Finally, next to finally, for a really bad sore throat, you're going to need viscous lidocaine. And I have them mix it with my lanta just because it sticks to their throat and seems to have a soothing effect. And obviously, everyone needs an oximeter. And with that regimen, um, you know, you're stopping the suffering of the disease. And at the same time, you're killing the virus. When you give Paxlovid and the pharmacy sometimes leave this off, it's essential they take it after eating 
Otherwise, they get to see what it looks like again. So the Paxlovid on an empty stomach? No. Paxlovid after breakfast? Yes. Paxlovid after dinner? Yes. My main days, and we actually just kept track, within three days, patients on Paxlovid feel better with that regimen. Uh, if they're under 60, I keep them on children's aspirin uh, for 30 days, no surgical procedures for 30 days. And there is a hint of information that you want to keep cardiac activity down for a couple of weeks. And whether that's two weeks or six weeks, no one knows. So I settled on four weeks of no aerobic exercise. Is that helpful? That's very, very helpful. Thank you. I would like to ask about a couple more things while we've got you here. Uh, are you using, I know it's very hard to get, but the GSK products, the Travamab, um, if you would comment on that. You know, I've had a couple of my patients who've had these home health agencies. I couldn't find them any of the Travamab. So they found some home health agencies that came to their home and gave them Regeneron antibodies, which of course don't work. So it was an interesting uh, thing because we specifically told them what to do. If you would comment on Sertravimab, and then also there's a new one out called Evusheld, which is supposed to last for six months in monoclonal antibody, the way, which if you would comment on those. Sure. I want to start with Evusheld, which is a godsend. We have in Tampa well over a thousand patients with common variable immunodeficiency. This provides five to six months of semi-normal life for them, okay? Additionally, for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, obviously poor antibody production, and patients with selective antibody deficiencies and those with HIV, cancer, and transplant. And I give those patients Evusheld, um, but I'm also prepared to jump on that vulnerable group, vulnerable group of patients with Paxlovid or also a combination of Paxlovid and fluvoxamide. Fluvoxamide prevents fusion within the cell of organelles assembling the virus. Whereas if they do get together, the pavloxid prevents chain termination. So it makes endless chains of useless virus. Um, so in a couple of patients, um, there's significantly immunosuppressed bone marrow, et cetera. I'll use both drugs. And if I could find molnupinavir north of Miami, I would use some of that too. Um, so, so Uchimab, the monoclonal uh, is in such short supply that at Tampa General, uh, we're one of the few places that have it, we got a grand total of 22 doses yesterday. Mm. And we have 40 patients waiting, okay? Mm. Um, that medication uh, is an anti-spike protein for Omicron. It's very effective. The infusion lasts an hour. Um, it's just hard to get. The other alternative is three days of outpatient remdesivir, mm -hmm. where they're brought in, they receive, we bring them into the infusion clinic and we give them remdesivir, um, one dose three times a day for three days, and that's 75% effective at keeping them out of the hospital. That's actually a very good number because I only give remdesivir uh, to patients at risk, patients with a high BMI, diabetics, cancer, transplant, things like that. So it's, so it's a very effective drug. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lockwood, um, you had touched on this earlier, so I'd like to revisit it, and that would be about vaccine hesitancy. As you know, there was a rally 
in Washington, D.C. this past weekend on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, of all places, led by RFK Jr., whose wife referred to him as reprehensible. That doesn't portend well, I don't think, for the marriage going forward, but I, a lot of us would agree with her. If you would talk about vaccine hesitancy, I, I, I found a pre-COVID study looking at people who refused to get vaccinated. This is pre-COVID, so this is about three or four year old study. And they found these people, it was not demographics. It was not socioeconomic status. It was not education. It seems like the people who don't want to get a vaccine are people who are conspiratorial thinkers. They have a highly individualistic outlook valuing themselves over society. And they have a generalized disgust toward blood and needles. But if you would talk about vaccine hesitancy, Dr. Lockwood, that would be yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that it comes in, in multiple forms, um, particularly, uh, you know, in minority groups, it could be a fear of um, uh, of being manipulated, like, the t you know, for example, in African-American communities, because of tuxedo, 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 I can never say that word, Excuse Alabama, <laughs> they, uh, 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 clearly, um, for um, particularly for undocumented aliens, they're afraid of, of coming in contact with with uh, the system, if you will. Um, I think you've 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 certainly identified another subgroup uh, that that are vaccine hesitant. There's some that are just purely politically driven, which is mind boggling in and of itself. Um, but in addition to all that, there there is a legitimate sense of fear. Um, that can be created when you hear of relatively rare risks. Um, you know, uh, Daniel Kahneman and, and, and uh, has written so well on this topic in Thinking Fast and, and Slow. Um, people will exaggerate s slight risks. Um, and in their mind, if you say there's a 10% increase in blank, um, they'll remember the 10%, not the fact that the that 10% represents a one in a million risk. So there's this, this basic, the basic heuristics of human thinking, our subconscious uh, uh, mind at work, um, kind of work against us with this. Now, the, the antidote is a to create as many default situations as possible so that they actually have to work hard to not get something. That's one way around it. The other is to point out the great risk of not doing it um, and to uh, kind of overwhelm them with data that show that there is a much higher risk of dying of, of COVID-19 than the five and a million risk of the side effect. Um, so, you know, but it is hard. It's very hard to break that psychology. Um, and, you know, it's, it obviously represents in Hillsborough County, 40% or if you exclude the five-year-olds, maybe 30%, uh, the under five-year-olds, probably 30% of the population. Um, and it, it probably is also exacerbated by, you know, the American tradition of rugged independence, kind of mm -hmm. our, the, the Scotch-Irish influence on, on distrusting all authority figures and beating them up, if at all possible, um, or at least getting into a fight with somebody in a bar. Um, right. And so all those things uh, are well known to the Lockwood family, at least, um, unfortunately, and my my Ohio and Kentucky cousins, um, and you know, trying to rationally explain all this to them is a fool's errand very often. So I, I'm sympathetic, um, but um, but it still enrages me. Well, looks. I think we're getting down to the hardcore folks who don't want to be vaccinated these days. When I try to talk to these folks, it's really not a lot of logic involved, um, you know, in my practice, I'd say probably about one in five folks who won't get vaccinated. And, and uh, it's just hard drilling down into that, but that's very helpful. Let me ask you something uh, on our last uh, seminar, we talked about uh, the federal government and the mandates toward uh, large employers and healthcare workers. And you were watching that very carefully. It looks like it is going to go forward with healthcare workers, although Florida of course is still in play. Um, how is that going? I know you probably already have a staffing shortage. I mean, uh, we sort of, a lot of hospitals do likely. So uh, what do you think about the vaccine mandate for healthcare employees? Yeah, well, it, 
you know, my legal friends and, and uh, I do actually have lawyer friends. It's painful. <laughs> um, have, have argued that in fact, the, the, the case for the vaccine was flawed because they said that, that uh, the argument that the, that the federal government made was that this vaccine would prevent transmission. It doesn't prevent transmission. I mean, just look at the, the huge number of folks that have been vaccinated that, that have gotten sick. It prevents severe disease, particularly if you've gotten the, 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 the uh, uh, booster, but it doesn't prevent uh, transmission. So the whole legal argument was based on a flawed scientific argument. Um, and they probably made the right decision as relates to big companies and, and from that standpoint at least. Um, the, the, they limited the application in healthcare settings um, to healthcare facilities that contract with Medicare. So that actually excludes physicians' offices. So at USF Health, if you don't, if you don't actually admit patients to TGH or to Moffitt or, or one of our other hospitals, um, and you just simply work in an outpatient setting at USF Health, we don't have a vaccine mandate. I mean, we would make folks wear a, a mask, but there is no vaccine mandate. So hopefully that will prevent some of the loss of staff that uh, we can't afford to lose. But um, that's the position we've taken. Um, if you work at a hospital and you require, you're required to take uh, the vaccine because of the federal mandate, um, we are certainly looking at, at you know, religious exemptions um, and of course any medical exemption. And we're, we're pretty tolerant of the, um, we're new light congregationalists when it comes to uh, the religious exemption. So if you come up with any kind of argument at all, we're probably gonna buy it. So that's kind of how we have uh, approached this and uh, hopefully we will not alienate uh, any of our staff. Uh, they certainly understand, I think, that we can't control um, what we can't control. And if you, uh, you work at, at Tampa General uh, or Moffitt, um, you're going to have to get vaccinated, and we can't do much about that. Uh, as I say, they may not accept the religious exemption that, 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 uh, that we, we just accepted, but probably Tampa General would. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank, I just saw where Houston Methodist was letting uh, their employees with active COVID come to work, uh, you know, with active COVID. And they're letting them work in the COVID ward, or they're putting them somewhere where they're not exposing. But they actually have active COVID coming to work. Uh, Doctor Holt, uh, Doctor Walensky from the CDC uh, is talking about the terrible state of public health in this country overall. We're down 80,000 employees nationally. Uh, we, she was stating, and I'm just going to use her words, we need a comprehensive, digital, real-time, integrated data infrastructure. We don't really even know how much COVID is out there, and any information we're getting is six weeks behind. So I would imagine you feel somewhat understaffed and underfunded in, in your situation. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's very accurate. I think if you look at, um, it, it really started with the Great Recession with uh, reduction of funding. And uh, we've lost about 40% of our funding since that time. Wow. Um, the, you know, Dean Lockwood mentioned something that I think besides staff and everything else, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a pernicious undermining of public health, uh, both in... Uh, some of the legislative actions being taken, but also in the general public. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, with some of the way the CDC has had to change and go back and forth has created, uh, you know, some, a lot of skepticism. And, um, you know, those are challenges that I think, uh, you know, really gonna face us besides just resources. Uh, the data sharing, it, in the state of, or in the country, the United States, this is a state responsibility. Uh, if you travel into Europe, everybody has a vaccine card that every that 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 isn't a handwritten uh, uh, card that is issued by a state, uh, and um, so there's and it's it's like 
combining medical records and things. Everybody has their own system and many states don't invest a lot in that data. So um, yeah, I, when I, I mean, I'm 25 years now into the public health uh, and I've seen, I, I guess the, the, the good times and <laughs> the bad times, I'm really hoping the pendulum does swing and uh, you know we will find something. But we've gone from being, I would say the good guys when we did with anthrax and uh, uh, Zika and other things to now, you know, really the, the bad guys in some people's minds. And that's a real, that is probably a greater threat to public health than any of these dollars and staff and everything else. I think it also allows certain politicians to justify reducing your funding. So it's a poisonous thing. Dr. Cancio, um, a couple of things. One, if you'd give us a brief uh, breakdown on masks, if you would just uh, highlight masking for a minute. You know, uh, Dr. Walensky at CDC, she stated one day, she said any mask better than no mask. And then two days later, you had a retraction from the CDC saying that cloth masks probably don't work very well. But if you would contrast Dr. Cancio, uh, cloth, surgical, K95s, N95s, double masking. Uh, and then if you would, uh, Finn, when you're finished with that, I want to ask you a question about long COVID. But if you would talk about masking, please. Sure. Uh, there are many, obviously there are many masks. The, the, the cloth masks are not as good. Uh, they, they, they're just not effective, I mean. Um, also, I think it's important that people understand before we start talking about any mask. Prior to COVID, we used a mask once and it went to the garbage. So once a mask was used, it was considered contaminated and went to the garbage. Now we're using masks and reusing them and reusing them, but we need to understand that a mask cannot be worn forever. <laughs> and that's an important concept. Now, when it comes to masks, there are different levels of masks. Uh, cloth masks are not um, um, are not as useful. The next the next mask is going to be a surgical mask, a simple surgical mask, and then we call that a level one mask. Um, and uh, and those uh, can help against the flu, against those things, but it, it doesn't have a tight uh, fit. It um, a lot of times falls down, doesn't hold up well enough. So there's a lot of issues with that. And even if you have it all well, um, you know, still there's many areas where it can come into the air. The next level mask is something called a level three mask. You see those used a lot in the ORs. And a lot of the level three masks even come with a, uh, with a shield, with, a, um, with an eye shield. Those are thicker. Those are better masks. Um, they're tied on the back and they're more secure and they have, uh, uh, and we, um, those are very commonly used um, in, um, in the OR. And those are something that is a little easier to tolerate than an N95 and actually a very good protection. And you don't have to get it fitted. So for healthcare workers, that's an option. Uh, the next mask um, is going to be the N95 mask. The N95 mask that we actually healthcare providers use, number one, has to be fitted. And, um, and, and it has to be fitted correctly. You put it on and you blow and make sure there's no air around it. And you suck in and make sure that it's sucking in. You have to have a well-fitted mask. Women, we don't have usually, we usually don't have hair in our face. But one of the funny things to see somebody with a, with uh, with uh, a beer or something, there's no way you can fit a mask like that. A mask has to be, an N95 mask has to be totally, totally fitted and properly, and you have to know your right size and you have to continue to use the one that fits you properly. And you have to check it every time you use it. Um, it kind of like in between the level three and the N95 is at the KN95. And those are very good for the general population because they're not as good as the N95, but you don't need to fit it and it fits pretty good. But you don't need that fit um, testing and all of those things that you should do with an N95. Um, so, um, so in general, uh, anything, or anything less than a surgical mask, you're really not doing much. Uh, in the outside, you probably don't need a mask. 
And, uh, and if you're gonna go into places where you're concerned, um, I would suggest for the general population, a, a KN95, us in healthcare use an N95, well-fitted, we test it every time, um, and that is a good option. And, um, and sometimes that, that level three for healthcare providers can be an in-between that uh, can be very protective. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's a review of what I if you could give, and I apologize because we're, our time is starting to slow down. I've still got a number of questions from my audience. If you would give us a, just a minute or two about long COVID or residual COVID, Dr. Sennett had uh, referred to that about, you know, people who are casually getting COVID, they might think, well, what's the big deal? And of course, now some of the studies are showing that as many as half the people who are hospitalized 30 days later are still having symptoms. <laughs> The problem is that you don't know who's going to get long COVID. And definitely, the, I mean, pulmonary problems go on for a while. And we don't know what the long-term effect. But the two areas um, that are most concerning about long COVID is a lot of the neurological symptoms, especially that, that feeling that their brain doesn't work correctly, that foggy feeling um, and persistent headaches and some other neurological issues that have been a, a, a significant concern. And then obviously are all the vascular complications, whether it's, um, we have seen patients with pericarditis, myocarditis, uh, and obviously all the clotting things. So uh, everything that has to do with the vascular system with the clotting, pericarditis, mericarditis, but also the neurological issues, mainly um, the um, uh, lack of concentration. I have patients that tell me that they haven't been able to drive for a while, they get confused and fatigue. Uh, so there are, this is, is, it almost reminds you of the chronic fatigue syndrome uh, where no matter what you do, I try to, to, to give them symptomatic relief, they just not what they used to be. And, they, and, and we see a lot, I mean, and I see a lot of patients that are very successful, um, I mean, whether they may be physicians, uh, immunologists, I mean, people that, uh, you know, because people are always, physicians trying to sometimes say, well, they're faking it. No, these people really want to go back to their jobs and to their prior lives. Um, we have also see, seen uh, in some of the teenagers, I have seen a lot of headaches, a, a lot of can concentrate in school as well, have hard time reading. So it's a lot of neurological concentration. That kind of thing has been a big issue. Uh, again, a little bit re uh, reminiscent of chronic fatigue syndrome, um, kind of like that, that's general. Interesting. Now, and, there, and there's some experimental models now where you can actually find uh, COVID fragments in the CSF and those kinds of things that so does seem to correlate with some of that. Uh, Dr. Sennett, um, I apologize, we're starting to get lower on time. Would you just take a minute and bat around some of the alternative therapies that are being out there? Hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, uh, and then recently uh, this little sisterhood of weed nuns are recommending pot. So if you'd hit hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and cannabis as far as treatments. Well, given the choices, I'll take number three. <laughs> That's right. Who have been proven to not only work, not work, but in higher doses, toxic. Uh, many patients with rheumatoid arthritis take hydroxychloroquine. They have the same answer to COVID of anyone else, mm -hmm. the same amount of. So I don't even know where that got started. Uh, ivermectin is insane. Uh, ivermectin is a great, of all things, it's an anti malarial and a secret for traveling physicians if we ever get to traveling again, is it's the only oral medication that's an excellent insect repellent. So when I travel, I think ivermectin with me. It's malariocidal and I don't get bit. I sure don't take it for COVID. It does nothing for COVID. It makes the patient sicker and it's immoral. As far as Sisters of the Weed go, uh, I think they're helping more people than they're killing, but they're not curing any disease. <laughs> All right, let me just ask you uh, one more quick one and then I'll move on. Uh, so we hear a couple of terms that are being used almost interchangeably. One of them is herd immunity, and the other one is endemic. So Dr. Osterholm, who's been out in the news quite a bit, was saying 
he didn't know what the word endemic meant. So would you just talk for a minute about herd immunity and endemic and whether those are goals that you think will be accomplished? Uh, this is for Senate, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's you. Um, first, herd immunity is a concept. It's not uh, a uniform scientific fact. I only need to refer you to what happens with chlamydia, the most common disease in America today, strep throat, tetanus, rabies, any number of viruses, okay? So for some viruses, you can develop herd immunity. For some, you don't. We really are not sure why you develop it to some and not others, okay? The idea of herd immunity uh, is best for respiratory viruses. And in it, you have so many people immune that a non-immune person really doesn't spread it. Now, we're not sure that that can exist with this virus because some of the most highly vaccinated countries in the world are experiencing massive outbreaks of Omicron now. So if this were a stable virus, if it were a DNA virus, it would be a much better bet that we could develop herd immunity. For the moment, um, no country has done that. Uh, what we're going to have to do, I think, is rely on vaccines and developments in antivirals like Paloxavid. I know, I mean, I think this particular virus, we've got three problems. We've got one, the vaccines don't seem to last very long. Secondly, it's highly contagious and it's asymptomatic early, so you can spread it, not even know you have it. And then thirdly, I guess there are going to be some animal reservoirs with a lot of these coronaviruses. So even if we've gotten it beaten in the human group, it might be hanging around in some animals. So if I could enlarge on that for a second, in a survey of deer in Virginia, 40% of the deer had human Omicron. Oh. 50% 50, 50 of the lions in the New York Zoo have Omicron and are laying around not moving and coughing. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Dr. Dr. Lockwood, if you would take a moment, uh, we've had a couple of questions from the audience about travel. Is it safe? Um, can you address, you know, uh, cruising? Can you address flying in an airplane? Can you address going to foreign, foreign countries? Uh, what, what is your take on the, the, the risk of travel these days? Yeah, uh, um, since we probably have the highest saturation of Omicron on the planet, I don't see why we shouldn't. Um, it's a pain in the butt traveling elsewhere because you have to be tested every four minutes. Um, for example, if you go to um, the BVI, um, just as an example. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to me that, that I'm sure that, that John and, and, and maybe Dr. Cancer have views on this, Doug, as well, but um, airline travel is relatively safe. Everybody's wearing a mask. There's excellent airflow. We're not seeing big outbreaks of, of, uh, of COVID from air travel. The, um, the obviously travel internationally often requires vaccines, which is good. Um, and mass, so that's beneficial. I think it's just a hassle. It's just requiring all these tests. And then there's some areas that are that have even worse levels of Omicron spread than we have. But um, you know, at this point, the planet's saturated with the virus. Um, I, I don't know that it makes much of a difference. Very good. That, thank you. Very helpful. Um, Dr. Cancio, could you just comment on a couple of questions here? One of them was on flu rona, which I guess is a combination of the flu and corona, and delta cron, which can you get both delta and omicron at the same time? I am not aware that you can get both at the same time. I don't know what Dr. Senna would think, but 
uh, but that right now, um, as of um, right now, more than 99% of the uh, populate of all the um, coronavirus in our communities is Omicron. So there's not much, no Delta right now. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, Dr. Holt, um, there's a question about the director of Orange County Health Department being placed on administrative leave. Do you know anything about that? Um, yes, I do. Um, Dr. Pino, uh, he's a colleague. Uh, he's an excellent, quite experienced public health uh, professional. Um, he wrote an email. Uh, it was a well-intended email uh, that uh, uh, was viewed by some as uh, shaming people who had not been vaccinated, perhaps. Uh, uh, others uh, questioned whether it was an attempt to coerce people to get vaccinated. Um, the one thing I would take away from reviewing the email is that it is uh, not, uh, it is in conflict or at least certainly not con consistent with what the state surgeon general and the governor are announcing and, and we do serve at the pleasure of the governor. So uh, I think it's a wording issue. Uh, uh, I think we all know that sometimes you write an email, you shouldn't send it until you uh, sleep on it. Um, you know, he, he said that public health, uh, you know, this is what public health is. And, and if we don't practice it, we're not really public health. Although uh, uh, the state surgeon general know that we've taken a more passive role in uh, promoting vaccines. Um, and uh, I think the other is timing. Uh, I wrote something, I would say similar, not, not nearly for a little more diplomatic. I don't think I shamed anybody. I, I thanked everybody in my county and health department that had been vaccinated and, and mentioned that, you know, I'm hopeful and I'm sure others will be following. But I did it in April 2020 when the governor was very supportive of vaccines. So I think, you know, it's a, uh, we live in, we're public servants. Um, and um, I think the letter, he could have got his point across perhaps without the phraseology. I do not what the outcome will be. I think he's on administrative leave. I guess we all have to be aware of the power of the hazards of speaking truth to power, don't we? Um, Dr. Sennett, um, so do you think, you know, we right now we're looking at for the flu, we've got uh, 41 million cases of Europe, uh, 710,000 hospitalizations, 52,000 deaths from the flu every year. RSV, uh, 15,000 deaths, uh, highway death toll, 39,000 deaths. Do you see us living with COVID and maybe treating it with the Paxlovid and some of the other things just as another infectious disease that comes along and you diagnose it and you treat it and, uh, and you live with the uh, outcome? Uh, I think eventually it's going to come down to each of us deciding what our risk tolerance is. There is going to be repeated assaults of new variants. Uh, some will be better, some will be worse. Secondly, at any given time, the, you could be going up on the rate, which would be a good bad time to travel there, or it could be coming down. And third, you need to look at yourself. If I had had a triple bypass, was diabetic, had COPD, and a high BMI, uh, I don't think I'd leave my house. Um, you would have to make a decision. And I don't doubt that they would probably use AI, and someone's probably doing it now, to come up with a risk calculator. You can tell your relative risk before you do something. And then you can make a decision based on what's going on. Like uh, we have this new BA2 variant. Uh, it's obviously spreading faster than the original Omicron. Right now in Denmark, in two weeks, 
it's 45% of the Icelands in two weeks. Uh, so would I go to Denmark now? No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think the Scandinavian countries would be quite low on the list. So that's a decision based on the virus, okay? Now, Gasparilla is coming. I don't think people should be in big crowds and I think they should wear a mask and be vaccinated. That's not going to happen. But on the other hand, the cases are sharply falling in Hillsborough County. So that makes a little bit safer, okay? And then finally, you need to look at your own health. If you have common variable immunodeficiency and you're counting on Evusheld to keep you out of trouble, that's a real risk. Does that way of looking at it make sense to you? It does. I guess what uh, the individual asked the question was thinking about modeling going forward in a world where we had enough tax loaded or um, remdesivir or sultramivir, when we had a world where those things were available uh, and throwing in, the, I, I wonder how that world would look. Would it be a manageable thing? Yes. Of course, do, do you think we're going to get enough of those things at some point? Do you think the supplies? Okay. Well, you're asking me, does capitalism work? It <laughs> works very well. Yes. So Pfizer is busy cranking out Paxlovid like you can't believe. And it will open up travel for all of us. If you could put like a Z pack, put that in your luggage with a couple rapid tests, would you travel? I bet you would. I yep. would. Okay, very good. That's exactly the question they were asking. Listen, what a great panel. Thank y'all so much for giving your time. I apologize we didn't run over, but We've still got a number of questions that we could run with, but thank you so much. You've really given great clarity. And once again, I think all of our people speak with humility because we know if we do this again in a few months, we may very well change all of our answers. So have a great week and I hope it's a good year for all of you. God bless and thank you. If I could make a comment, we need to thank both you and Dean Lockwood for your leadership in this area. As I look around the country, people that have the most trouble don't have a strong county medical society and don't have a strong medical school dean. Those places are nightmares. So between the two of you, I really think you've made a difference and meetings like this are very helpful. John, you're, you're, you're way too kind, um, at least in my case, I don't think you're, you're too kind for, with Joel's comments, but, um, and obviously I'm incredibly proud of, of all of you all. Um, what an extraordinary job uh, our infectious disease team has done, uh, Margarita's team um, and the heads of care folks and just everybody. And um, I've never seen an organization uh, perform at this level and for such a long time with such excellence and frankly, with such good morale. So um, it's easy to be a dean with such a great school. Well, I'm not, we're, I think we're all very lucky to be where we are at the time that we're here. So God bless and I hope everyone has a wonderful year. Thank you for coming out and we'll hopefully do another one of these soon. Okay. Take care. Have Thank a great you. day. Nice.